and and our journey with with learning. Um, so, uh, is anyone here trying to run a company, trying to build a business? Interested in startups? Interested in learning? Okay, so we'll talk a little bit ab about that. And I'm happy for this to be very interactive. So you can ask me questions and, and comments and things. But I know you're, you're from Malaysia, so you won't do that. <laughs> right? Okay. So I've, I've been to Malaysia 30-something 30, 30 times. So uh, I'm a bit local, huh? Okay, huh? Okay, so you can, you can treat me a little bit local. Okay. So a little bit about me. I, I founded a company called Service Rocket. Has anybody heard of Service Rocket? Seen these t-shirts around KL Central? That's our company. This is one of the only photos where I don't wear this. But if I take my shirt off, I have a tattoo here. Okay? Uh, and so I, I, I run a company. I'm also a, a husband and a father. And I'm a wannabe musician. Okay? So I try to do that. Um, so my, my journey actually started off at a company called IKEA, or you call it IKEA, here. And I was there when I was 14. And I learned a lot of things at, at, at this place. Has anyone shopped here before? It is so efficient at getting things done, right? And did you take the instructions back and learn what to do to build the furniture? Yeah, was it frustrating? But if you're a nerd, did you just work it out? Yeah? And how many of you here write software or work in technology companies? And, and how much time and effort do you put into your instructions? Right? But we're also in an age where we don't need instructions. How many people here use Facebook or Instagram or Tinder? Right? Uh, and did you ever read the manual for those? So the, we live in a world where we, we don't want manuals, right? Readme.txt, we don't want it, right? So uh, I, I studied at UTS, which is the University of Technology in Sydney. And I, I started when I was 17 working in this company called Borland. Has anybody heard of Borland? It's sad that nobody has. Uh, so the, the SC++ and Pascal and Delphi and things, that's where I, I, I learned how to program. Uh, and then I, I moved to the US uh, when I was 20 years old to become a trainer. And uh, the blue car is here. This is the actual rental car that I had. So you can imagine, I land there, here's your rental car, have to drive on the wrong side of the road, and they give me this, right? Um, but at the bottom right was really what I did. I, I traveled from company to company teaching five-day Java programming training courses on a product called WebLogic from BEA Systems, which is now part of Oracle. And you can tell this is, this is year 2000, 2001. The computers are beige, right? Big monitors, right? This was state-of-the-art. This was a company called eBuilt in California. They were building some large sites. And I used to just fly between, between offices of different companies and, and teach courses. Um, and then a couple of things happened, right? So some of you are too young to remember the dot-com bubble, but it burst, and I had to get married, so I flew back to Australia, right? And then when I got back to Australia, I started the company that we're in now, so 15 years ago. So now, as a company, uh, Service Rocket, we started in Sydney. We celebrated 10 years in Malaysia last year. So we started in Malaysia with, with one guy working in Starbucks, right? And now we have, I think, 140 people here in, in KL Central. So um, we're 240 people as a company. We have more Malaysians in our company than any other, right? And now our headquarters is, is, in, is in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley, right? So we are taking Malaysian-built technology to Silicon Valley and to the world. Right, which is a very, very unique thing. And then in 2013, we opened in the bottom right-hand corner. This is in Chile, right, in, in Santiago. They have one tower. We have two. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay. So as a company, we have uh, 2,000 active customers. But on the left-hand side, you notice all of these guys are technology companies. And what we do as a company is we help them teach their customers how to use their software. And then on the right-hand side, these are the types of companies that use our products and, and our services to, to make that happen. So, uh, but let's, let's jump into learning and the future of learning and what that means, right? So, you know, for, for a, a long amount of time, the way that we learned things 
was the same. We would go to class, we'd sit down in a room, and even in the year 2000 during the dot-com bubble, the training courses were five days in a classroom. Right? And so the first thing I want everyone to understand is really the human computer interface. And as the human com computer interface changes, right, so does how we learn. Right? So if we, we start back, uh, let's look at the, the, the text human computer interface. Right? Everyone got one of these? Does anyone know what this is? Some of you are too young. Right? This is MS-DOS right, with some basic code. And if you had graphics, this is what they look like. Right? And back then it was, this is the future of learning. This is actually a learning game. Right? Is that exciting for anyone? No? That was the future of learning back then. So, so the first human computer interfaces, only geeks and nerds would be able to use it, was all text. It's actually really, it's quicker than most of the stuff today. Right? It was all text commands, keyboard shortcuts. I like this. See, they even highlight the keyboard shortcut. Right? Um, <coughs> so that was, that was kind of phase one. Um, Phase two, right, is the graphical user interface. We take a lot of this stuff for granted, especially those of you who still have hair, right? Um, so we had Windows, we had this thing called a mouse, and we had a thing called CBT, computer-based training, and along the lines we then had CD-ROMs of training that you could buy and put them in, right? Uh, and it would look something like this, and you would click a button, it would play a video for three hours, and then you'd have to guess what the answer is. Tutorials, right? And that, that, was, that was the human computer interface, right? Did anyone love learning that way? Okay. All right. So th the next, what happened after this? We, sorry? Touch screen, yeah. So some people say web. Web is kind of a better version of this. But we have, we have touch screens and touch. Yeah. So with, with touch screens, we're able to start to interact and play. And this, this is really scary because um, my, my five-year-old, but she was like one-year-old when a lot of this stuff came out, could use this stuff without a manual, without even being able to talk, right, and start to use it. And next generation is what? Yeah, it's called spatial, yeah? But this is like where, where you're in, right, you're immersed in the learning and you can touch and do this. Has anybody tried HoloLens or some of these technologies you have? Okay. Oculus, you're an Oculus guy? Okay. Um, so uh, a couple months ago, some of our product team went to Microsoft and we went in the basement and we got to play with HoloLens. And it's amazing what can be done and what things are possible, right? Actually, a little, little bit scary in, in some regards. Uh, we did a Skype call and we had somebody remote on Skype and we had HoloLens on. And as you know, Skype right now, you go to your computer, you do a Skype call, but you flick them in the background of the window and you go and do Facebook, right? Or you have a Skype call, right? And you come back and then you talk to them. So in, in HoloLens, so you have the little Skype window. I'm like, okay, I'm going to talk to YC here. And I can grab him and stick him on the wall like a photo frame. And he's there talking. And I can look around. And when I look back, he's there talking again on the, on the frame, which is nice. But he can flick it into a mode where he sees what I see. Right, so through my glasses, he is now in my glasses, and we did a demonstration at, at Microsoft where we actually took live electrical circuits, and somebody was uh, remote, and they were telling us which wires to disconnect and connect to, to make the lights work and change the circuit breakers, and they were doing that through through Skype on Hololens. Now that actually isn't really that's not VR. There's a little bit of AR in, in, in augmented reality where I have a window and I can see YC talking there. And it's really just, just very good video. Right? When you think about it, your, the headset has a camera in it and people can see it. And, and, and it's just tying those two things together to make the experience more immersive. Right? The instant you put on glasses, for me, it's about getting rid of all the distractions and being very present with learning. Right, the best times you learn is when you're, you're very present. And the more that you can get somebody present in the learning, the better. And so more and more, things are about how do you get somebody present versus all of the distractions and, and, and what happens is one of the big challenges. So where, where do we go from here? And there are, there are thousands of videos online about HoloLens. And I'm, I'm not, I didn't want this session to be, let me just show you all the different 
cool things that are happening with VR and AR. The space is absolutely hot right now. So if you're a startup and you want to play around with something in this area, it's amazing what's going to happen so quickly in how we're going to learn and be immersed in, in what's happening. So, okay. <clears throat> are there any questions before I, before I move on? No? Okay, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit more about some of the other stuff that's coming. Okay, so, so the next one is, well, well humans don't, are not the only things that need to learn, also machines can learn. Right, we talk about artificial intelligence, and this is where everyone thinks straight away. Right, um, I was at a talk at a conference in Boston uh, just last week um, by an AI specialist, and she put it in really good terms. She said the light bulb was one of the first bits of artificial intelligence that we had. And that was artificial light. Right? And what artificial light enabled us to do is to live longer and, and have get more out of our days and do more things with them. Um, and so artificial intelligence is going to allow us to do more things, but isn't going to replace everything that we do. Right? We can't all go fishing, unfortunately, and, and, and let the machines do everything. Uh, the world, though, is, is moving along a little bit where, where the machines and the technology are becoming more human-related, right? So um, if you're using Messenger or some of the other bot-driven technologies, um, you'll have agents. There are currently agents. There are a lot of companies right now in, in the Valley that are spitting up bots that do things for you, take care of customer service. And what we're seeing is a world where you'll have agents and assistants, right? So the agent will be the service that's being provided to you, but your assistant is someone who knows something about you, right? So instead of a human interacting necessarily with a bot, you'll have an, an assistant that will know things about your preferences and have that service take care of things with the next service. So how, how does this affect learning? What? Sorry? Yeah, computers get, get a lot smarter. They kind of know where you're going to be stuck, right? And, and where friction is going to happen. So th there's different reasons why you want to learn, which I'll cover. Um, I've got some slides on that later on. But there's, there's tactical learning, or really just getting my job done, that I need to get things done right now where I don't feel a personal connection to or a personal motivation to, right? And it might just be a small victory like getting tickets to a concert, right? But I need to navigate a website or it might be putting my IKEA furniture together, right? Once I get it done, who cares, right? It's done. But from a, from a learner's point of view, it, it, it's, it's not anything, I don't want to become certified in doing that, right? So. When you're putting, you know, the, the learning space as a whole needs to have an outcome. And understanding what that outcome is is really important to then work out the motivation of, of what you're trying to do. Um, one thing that I spend a lot of time doing is just looking at how the major forces and the major, kind of like the major tectonic plates are moving and what are they doing. So you have the big five, right, which is Apple, Google, Facebook. Microsoft and Amazon, and have a look at what they're doing in all the various technology areas and how some of those things might, might come together. So, you know, Microsoft's very big on Cortana. Even Amazon has this thing. Has anybody seen Amazon Echo? This freaky device that sits in your living room and listens to everything you say, right? <laughs> right, and it's kind of a version of Siri that's a little bit more freaky, right? But because it, it sells you things and you can order toothbrushes and all that kind of stuff online, right? Um, and it goes one step further. So th there's a reason. So we started the company in, in Sydney, and then we opened up here in, in Malaysia, and we realized that we wanted to be where technology was happening and where technology was moving. So we, we opened up in Palo Alto. And on our street, every day, there are these things driving up and down. Right? And then, does anyone know what this is? This is the Google, Google self-driving car. Right? And... Uh, they're kind of annoying, right? Because they drive at the speed limit, right? And there are people in them with joysticks that, that drive them. Um, and if you look at 
the learning that's involved in, in the vehicle and what it's trying to do and as it's trying to learn as it's going and things are becoming crowdsourced. Uh, this is uh, from Tesla's autopilot. So one of the most common cars in Silicon Valley is a Tesla. Right? And so they are clocking up millions of miles of autopilot. Right? This thing is a piece of software on wheels. Right? And there are a lot of rumors about what Apple is building uh, from their cars. But let's, let's bring it back to what we, we need to do in, in today's world if we're working in a, in a startup, even in not in a learning space or in a company trying to sell products. This is a very famous quote by uh, the founder or, or CEO of IBM, right, which is very common. He says, nothing happens until someone sells something. And that's the way the world used to work. Right? So once a deal was signed, the plant was created and all the products were made. Right? If there's no sale, nothing happens. Um, but something in the last 15 years has changed that and it's the age of the consumer, not the salesman. So how many of you go into stores right now and you know more than the person that's trying to sell you something? Right? More often than not. Right? So how many of you are selling products to customers and the customers know more about them sometimes than you do? Right? So there's a change in this, which is nothing happens until someone learns something. Because the consumer will learn and then they will go and buy, right? And at that stage, you, you have nothing to really affect the sales cycle. So this is huge in every area of business, right? Every area of product. Because if you're not putting content or the ability for someone to learn about what you do before they will buy, then you're, you're at a competitive disadvantage, right? So learning and knowledge is, is really a tool to get somewhere. If it's in an e-commerce or a business transaction, you're wanting to educate somebody or help them, right? To help them make a transaction happen. If you're in a K-12 to or you're running a school, this is totally different, right? Um, this has changed a little bit, a little bit more. My fonts have screwed up here. But really, nothing happens until something learns something, right? When we move into AI and machines and, and so forth, right? So keep that in mind, specifically this one here, is if you're not teaching your prospective customer base and educating them on why they should look at your space or buy from you, right? And it's a fine line between selling and educating, right? What we do as a company, we work with companies like, like Atlassian, like Docker, like Puppet Labs, like Nginx, Cloudera. We work, we work with software companies to help them teach their customers how to use their products. And some of our customers give their training away for free. Whereas 15 years ago, the training would be something that was done after somebody bought. Even when it's given away for free, we have to use a lot of techniques to have people be motivated to do the training to finish it, right? Could I, could I interest you in a five-day training course on how to do IKEA furniture so that one day when you buy IKEA furniture, you know how to put it together? Right. No, who's gonna do that? Right. Um, what's interesting is also the personal motivation of what's ha what, what happens is that uh, all of the material you would need or, or almost all of it to become a certified Oracle database administrator is for free on the internet. But if your boss said to you, can you go on the weekend and at night time and just watch some YouTube videos and become certified, would you do it? But if your boss said, hey, I'm going to put you through a $20,000 training program for Oracle, to become certified, would you do it, right? The knowledge is not the thing. It's, it's the scarcity of thinking that as a person, I'm gonna be more advanced than the people next to me and I'm gonna get more out of it. So more and more, we have to understand what motivates somebody to want to learn, right? Especially if the courses are even free. Because what you're competing against is the, the attention and the mind share for what's there. Right? And this happens over and over again in the, in the technology world. It doesn't matter what's better, what's faster, or what's cheaper. It's what has the mind share of what people think is going to get them ahead, which is what they're going to do. Okay. So uh, 
in conjunction with this, there's a large democratization of learning. Right? So there is the emergence of these things called MOOCs, which some of us have looked at and worked with. Does everybody know Coursera and Udemy and those kind of things? Um, they have millions of learners and people that have signed up for it, but they have less than 10% completion rate on the courses. Could you imagine if you ran a university and you had less than 10% of people completing the course? That's not even the degree, that's just the course. You gotta do like 10 of them to get a degree. Right? It's kind of crazy. Right? Um, we took this concept and we work with one of our customers, which is MuleSoft. Right? They're, they're an open source integration technology. And we created you know, a four-week MOOC course for them. And we got over 50% completion rate on thousands of developers going through the course every month. Both are free. How does that work? One big difference is this is a MuleSoft course being hosted by MuleSoft. Right? In this space, they would have a course on Coursera. Right? So a big part of this is the brand. Right? If I feel like I'm getting knowledge from the source that created it, there is an air of authenticity to it, and it's more appealing to me as a consumer. Therefore, I want to be a learner. Right? Do I want to get a, a certification in the technology from a third party, or do I want it from the source? Right? Everyone likes buying Apple genuine accessories, not the third party ones. <laughs> right? Yeah? So, so there, there, is a, there, there is definite work to do from a, from a psychology perspective to think about the brand, the brand of your company, how you want to have people associated with it. Right? And these are not really learning concepts, whereas before, learning was about studying the books and doing the test. Um, remember, you're, you're motivating somebody to do this, and a customer here may spend weeks learning the software before they even buy it. So it's, do I, do I work with the brand? Do I want to learn? Okay, then I'll decide that I should buy it. In this case, their product is open source, so they have to implement it, and then they have to pay for it at the end. Which is totally the other way around, which is like buy, train, implement, right? So think about some of these concepts because Things happen in the technology world before they happen in the general world. Right? Uh, in, the, in the case of Coursera and the MOOCs, they will talk about the millions of users that are signing up for courses. They talk very little about the completion rate right, of what's there. Okay, so is, is anyone familiar with this chart? So there is a book called Crossing the Chasm, which you, which you should read. It's not very long, so it's my style. right? Uh, and it talks about how technology moves through the different stages. Right? So technology will start with early adopters, and then it gets to a point where some people will play with it, and does it cross the chasm to become a mainstream technology? And then once it does, how long does it last until it falls down, right? Or, or it gets replaced by something else? So when you're working with technologies and you see new things come out, you know, VR and AR is definitely in this space, right? You have the big players like Facebook and Microsoft working in there. Google, I think October 4, has some pretty, pretty big announcements coming, right? Some of those technologies won't make it across the chasm, right? Google Glass, right? What's actually funny is that in two or three years' time, a lot of the VR, AR technologies will look just like Google Glass. Right? It's a case of too soon the technology, or what did they do? They freaked out the branding, right? So uh, Google Glass developed a reputation in Silicon Valley that the people wearing them were called glass holes, <laughs> right? Because there's like weird nerds walking around with them all the time, right? So th there, there are some interesting, interesting ways that these companies take the products to market, which even though they have billions of dollars and they're large companies, they get it wrong because they get the branding and the connection with the consumer wrong. Right? So learning is, is a really, really um, 
key part of how you, how you connect those things together. Okay, so the, the way we think about it and how I think about it with our, with our company is we, our product as a company is helping companies kind of cross over this chasm and get their adoption rates up. Because if more people use technology, the more people learn it, the more people buy it, and, and the more that it's successful. Um, but the way to, to get to this isn't about how many training courses can I run and have people go through training, right? Um, learning is a big part of it, but a big part of it is, is thinking about natural momentum and natural energy, right? So water and gravity, how do you understand where the friction point is, right? Either in the sales cycle or in the adoption cycle and, and move through it. So a, a, a big part of this is saying, well, um, sometimes companies, someone will download software and put it into the organization, and the geek or the nerd who put it in there, they know everything about it, but what happens to those kind of people after six months, if you're lucky? Right? They get bored, they change jobs, they do something else. And those, those are the people that are changing an organization or bringing in new ideas. Right? So in, in, in trying to get adoption, what you're trying to do is to work out what tools does that person need to educate the next kind of people in the organization before they, they run out of patience, right? So the idea is you want to try and turn it from spring to waterfall, right? And so this is different depending on your technology or depending on, on who you're trying to sell to, right? If I have technology that's being sold to a QA department, I can probably run a three or four day training course and they'll love it. If I'm having a technology that's sold to a, an end consumer, right? if you look at an iPhone or an Android phone, you are the end user and you're the administrator. You're everything in one. And if you need any kind of training in what you're doing, there's a problem. right? But if you're rolling out the same mobile app to 100,000 employees in your company, would you do some kind of training? you would do something so that users would, would get over any friction that they have. A lot of the time, that friction is actually social. It's, it's, not a it's not technical friction at all. It's like, should I do this? I don't want to be the one that does it wrong. Right? And then it comes back to confidence and, and building that inside of somebody. Right? So I, I think a, a key point in all of this is, is understanding that at the end of the day, most of the decisions are made by humans, and they have multiple options to choose from, and you want to position your products and your services to be the ones that people are more confident in. So branding is even more important. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so it's just the old adage of right, give them a fish or, or teach them how to fish, right? And in the old model, you would try and get as many people in training as you can. Right? Actually, you would try and send consultants out on site to deploy software for people. Right? Now, actually, if you get people trained, that's even better because they will do their own fishing and do their own rolling out. Um, and a, a model that, that, that really reflects and that we can work with here is, is a model that um, it's called the Golden Circle, which was put together by Simon Sinek. And it's really about why companies exist, but we can apply it to learning as well. And so. The idea here is, is thinking about getting to the core of what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it, right? So uh, in the example in the book, it's saying, okay, what do we do? We do computers, right? We design them brilliantly because we're Apple versus saying, what do we do? We have you know, some of the uh, other manufacturers that talk about CPU speeds and memory sizes and so forth and don't understand why they're doing something, right? So, but you can also apply this to learning and think about what you're trying to teach your students and how you're trying to connect with them to want to learn, right? So I, I believe what training is, is no longer needed, right? Most of what you need, you'll Google search or use Cortana or use Siri to get you the answer. Or this is like, hey, I'm, I'm stuck on my, putting my IKEA bookcase together. How do I do it, right? How is when I want to learn a little bit more about a craft or, or, or so forth? But the why is where you'll catch somebody, right? I'm going to become a doctor. 
So what do I need to do that? There's, there's, a, there's a, a reason why behind that. Right? So the more that you can think about your product and empowering somebody to, to attach it to their why, that's where you can apply learning and, and really benef benefit from it in your company or with your products. Uh, which is very different than I'm just going to put up a whole bunch of tutorials that, that answer questions. Right? More and more great design can cater for the what and even a lot of the how. Right? Uh, and they should also be reflected in, in the why. Okay. So that's the end of my slide. So I want to do some Q&A and some discussion um, so we can ask some questions. Thank you. Yes. Why do people want to learn? Um, gee, that's a, you want the full answer? <laughs> so why do I want to... I, I, I talk from my own experience, right? So I, when, when I started off, I wanted to learn because it would advance my career. Um, and when you're teaching technology training, uh, one thing to understand is that not only is somebody trying to build... Uh, if, if you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to build your own company. If, if you work for a company, you want to build that company, but you also want to build your own resume and build your own brand as a person as well. Right? So understanding that sometimes the most popular learning offerings are the ones that can strike the balance between building someone's career as well as benefiting the company that, that, that they're working at. Right? And so that's where... It's, it's kind of funny because when you think about it, certification in what? Why do I need to be certified in something? Certification really appeals to those who are building their careers because it gives them a mark of validation to go to another company and say, hey, I'm, I'm a certified expert in this database or this big data technology, and, and it gives a level playing field. For the company, it doesn't matter. Right? So uh, I think in the professional sense, people want to, want to learn because they can advance their career and, and make more money. Yes. T tips for you as a learner or, or someone who's making learning? Yep. Okay. So, um, so, so my view of the future, if, if we go back to that how, what, and why, is to focus as much on the why as possible. Because, um, you know, I still think I'm young, but I'm not. Um, and when, when I started, I was at Borland, and everyone was doing C++. And we got this CD in the mail from the head office, which was Java. And no one wanted to do Java because it was slow and what have you, and I learned it. Right? And unlike... Um, other careers where if, if you want to go in accounting or law, it's kind of like you get in the queue and you wait for someone to retire before everyone can advance, right? In technology, you just catch the next wave and it, it gets bigger than the, the previous one. So th the biggest thing to do is to, to catch, catch a wave that is going to cross that chasm. So if you're a Google Glass expert right now, who cares, right? So sometimes you can jump onto the next big thing, which doesn't become the next big thing. Um, but not being too wedded. So if you're a, if you're a Google Glass fan, you got to know when it's over, right? And jump to the next thing, not just stick with that. And so there's a level of getting past the what to the how and the why, and saying, well, I, I'm really interested in VR and AR, and that's my area, right? So whatever product is going to win, you're fine because that's your, your learning about spatial computing and spatial concepts and how they work. And then you can apply it to the different technologies that come out. So wh whatever you're learning, just know that in, in five years' time, it's going to be irrelevant. Right? I graduated you know, before Google, Facebook were created. <laughs> right? So it's hard to... You know, and Apple was like a $2 a share, because right? they were almost dead. So. Um, the technology ways will move, 
Um, and then for me, the, the, the way to predict the future is to kind of see what those big companies are doing. They don't always get it right, but they are, you know, those five companies are s uh, in the top seven largest companies in the world of those five companies, right? So they, they, they will dictate how the world will work. They won't always get it right, but it's a good sign of wh what's going to happen. Yes. 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 Yep. Yep. Um, so, so the the question is, I, I'm running a university course or running something targeted at university students. Yep. So, so I, I think there's two there's two levels to do. Um, if you're too theoretical, the students don't care at university. And if, if you're very practical, it's going to get out of date quickly. But I would still err towards the very practical. Because you, you can create something and fail. As long as at the same time, you're crafting a syllabus that also explains more of the how and the why. right? Um, but trying to keep it practical. I think I, I always got a lot more out of the practical things at university not the lectures about the TCPIP stack and the, the reasons, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, and, and I think anytime somebody can get success and have something created, I, I still remember the, the first pieces of Java code that I wrote that did something and the buzz I got out of it working. And that is something that, um, it, it's a bit of a high. And the more that you can create that, where students can feel that, I think that's a big part of motivation on, on getting people hooked on technology. Um, I, I failed math in grade 10. I got a D in grade 10 mathematics. Yet I can code. So go figure that out, right? And But if, if I couldn't learn how to program and do stuff, then I wouldn't have. Even at university, the hard mathematical subjects, I don't know how I did them, right? Somehow I did them. Pair programming. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and and in, uh, a little bit more detail in what space or just from a, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I, I struggle with that every day. Um, we, we, our offices are spread over four countries and we have a Latin American culture, a Malaysian culture, which has many subcultures, as you know. Australians, crazy. And then and the Americans, right? So, um, uh, and then trying to, trying to get cultural alignment of ideas is a never-ending job, right? Uh, and it, but it's something you have to love doing. So I enjoy communicating things. We, we, we use a lot of different platforms internally. Um, some people like to read things. Some people like to watch videos, so we do a lot of internal video. Um, some people like to ask questions. So you have a lot of engineers on staff. They always want to find the errors in everything you do. So you, sometimes you have to leave errors in there so they can find them, and then you can answer the questions the right way. I've got head of engineering is here. He didn't hear that. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think if you're going to lead a company or lead a group of people, your, your vision, no matter how well it's written down, it c can always be communicated better and better and better. And you need to never have the attitude of like, hey, I wrote it down. You should know what that is. Because you want to inspire people to, to want to learn and carry it even further. Right? And it's something I still struggle with at times. Yeah, you never stop. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing to understand is that you will never have all the ideas in a company. Right. Yes.
Yep. 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 Okay. So the first one is, is uh, are universities relevant? I'm summarizing, right? And, and what do you learn there given the material's out of date? Um, the biggest thing is to learn how to learn. So whenever you're stuck, just go meta, right? <laughs> so if you learn how to learn and learn how to work in groups, and learn how to work with different kind of people that annoy you, that's what university should do, right? Because um, you learn how to get things done and you learn how to, how to, how to grow. Um, and so that's a little, you know, a bit more in the syllabus is understanding that. And, and some of the best university courses that I've seen are the ones that assemble groups. Actually, in, in, at my university in Sydney, they, they will assemble groups with people from different degrees in different schools and make them do a group project together now. So it's not just the computer science full of all the nerds. It's like you have a marketing person and a finance person and they have to put something together. Th those are, the, those are in very innovative things that are, are good to put together. Um, but really motivating students to learn. Um, as, like I, I, I try and play guitar and there's this whole thing about should you have lessons and should you go to this kind of thing and, and there's an underlying piece which is you can become a musician on your own you don't learn how to play in a band and play with people unless you're hanging with people and learning how to play with them right and none of that is theory you could be the best guitar player but if you're an ass nobody wants to play with you and your music will sound very dry and very right so there there is an element of of that um and the, the second part of your question which was Um, so one of the things we do internally, uh, uh, how, how we find solutions to these things, is we run a thing called boot camp. So we take in a class of five to eight people, and we run a lot of training and group projects with them before we, we give them a job. And, and we kind of do that in a way to help them work out whether they like us and we like them and we, we see what, what happens. Um, there are some things that we, we were doing as well in interviewing is um, early on we were giving people broken systems and asking them to fix them and just seeing whether they can learn and find out how to solve problems. So we do some yeah, different programming exercises during interview, pair programming as well. So I, I think the, the uh, for us more and more it's about working with people that we want to work with um, because we spend so much time together. So Okay, final couple of questions. I have one minute before they're gonna like pull the microphone away from me. Yes. Some some companies think they don't need training or learning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, some of the companies we work with, yeah, there's definitely people in those companies and, and others that like, how do you know our product better than we know it, right? And we're like, well, we know how to learn better than you do. So it, it, it's, it's odd, but it, it actually makes sense to the right people. And if they can't get their heads in that space, we don't work with them because there's nothing worse than working with a customer that you're fighting with. Yeah, usually through referral. We, we, we work with the, the different software companies. Um, because what happens is software companies, like we want to write great software, we don't understand how, how people need to use it, which is kind of funny, right? Because they, they, they have a vision and they want to build product. And that's why we tackle it like removing friction. We try and help them understand where the friction is so we can get rid of that and help the product grow. So, yeah. Okay, last question. Can we go now? 
<laughs> hey, so I, I have some cards here, and uh, I, you know, we have an office here in, in Malaysia. So if anyone wants to stop by or or chat, I'm happy to to uh, uh, to learn from you. And if you're working on something interesting, please share it with me. I'm 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 always eager to learn. Uh, we 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 take Malaysian technology to Silicon Valley and the rest of the world, and some of the companies we work with use software that's built here in Malaysia. So thanks for having me. <laughs>